Lee. And uh, tonight we are debating the question, can a believer lose his salvation? The answer is no. And I am about to show everybody why. Oh, let's get this. There we go. Firstly, when it comes to salvation, what must we do to be saved? That's the most important question. The Bible is extremely clear. We are saved by faith alone, apart from works. You can be everlastingly saved by receiving the free gift simply by believing on Jesus Christ for it. We are saved by trusting in Christ, in Christ alone. His finished work is what saves, not our filthy rags. Romans 4, 5, but to him that worketh a little. No, it says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. The Bible does not say for him that worketh not and makes sure that he does not sin willfully, okay? There is no exceptions that uh, Jesus Christ gives. Now, the Bible reads in John 6, 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and in him, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. This is just one verse out of so many that undeniably proves eternal security. Notice, and him that cometh to me I will what? I will in no wise cast out. No wise. What does this mean? This is an important phrase that means in no way under any circumstance, any circumstance. And this includes sinning willfully. In no wise means under any condition and for any reason. Will Jesus cast out anybody who has been born again, regenerated? Can somebody who has been justified and predestined for glorification be cast out? Could they lose their salvation? Jesus says, I will in no wise, under any circumstance, cast you out. Can this be any more clear? Daniel will ask, well, what if you give the gift back? We heard that in his opening statement. What if you fall away? What if you willfully sin? We heard that in his uh, opening statement as well. Did you not read the very words of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior himself, Daniel? Under any condition and for any reason whatsoever, I will never cast you out. It's not possible. It's not even a thought in the mind of Jesus, in the mind of God himself. Daniel will give, as we have seen, many reasons that he thinks we can lose regeneration. We can be unborn, apparently. And Jesus says, no, you cannot lose your salvation. I will in no wise cast you out. I mean, debate over, guys. Let's all go home, pack it in. Jesus speaks this way for a reason. Never hunger, never thirst, never die, and I will in no wise cast you out. He speaks this way because people like Daniel here, my interlocutor for tonight, will still assert that we might die, we might hunger, we might thirst, and Jesus might cast us out. Heck, according to Daniel, he can pluck himself out of both the hand of Jesus and the hand of the Father. Wow, Daniel must be greater than God. Amazing. Jesus speaks this way about salvation because he wants us to know just how absolute our salvation is. It's final. It's done. We've been passed from death unto life. We are in the life now. We have everlasting life and everlasting life, believe it or not, literally means life that never ends. Life that is forever. Everlasting, according to Daniel here, would mean life that is temporary. Is that what Jesus said? We have temporary life? Of course not. Jesus also says, he who lives and believes in me shall never die. Never die in Greek is quite emphatic. It's a double negative. Never, ever die. It doesn't say never die unless you sin willfully or don't abide perfectly. The two main arguments he used in his opening statement. No, it doesn't say that. What is another way of saying eternal security? Never die. Never die. They'll say, well, eternal security is not taught in the Bible. Oh, really? Because Jesus said we will never die. Believe it or not, never die means never die. Daniel would have us believe that it is possible to lose everlasting life, even though Jesus said it is not possible. Jesus said the one who drinks the water of life will never thirst again. And Daniel says it is possible to thirst again. Daniel goes against the very words of Jesus himself. Who do we trust? Daniel and his erroneous interpretation and misunderstanding of Hebrews 10 and John 15? Or Jesus, God manifest in the flesh? 
The woman at the well knew this was everlasting life. She wanted it so she would never have to draw water again. She grasped. This was eternal. And once you got it, you could not lose it. Jesus said, he who eats the bread of life will never hunger again. Did Jesus say you will never hung hunger again unless you sin willfully, unless you don't abide, unless you don't bring forth good fruit? You will never thirst and never hunger again as long as you don't fall away? Is this what Jesus said? Nope. Daniel is adding to the text. What is eternal security? It is simply the teaching that if you are saved, you will never die. It's that simple. Jesus says the one who believes in him is in my hand and in my father's hand. No man can pluck them out of my hand or my father's hand. Jesus preached eternal security. You can't miss it. Do you believe Jesus or not? The Bible does not say no man except you. No man, ex uh, as long as you don't sin willfully. I'm sorry, but you are either a man, a woman, or a human. <laughs> you are not greater than God. To say you can pluck yourself out of his hand or his father's hand is to say you are greater than God. What we actually see here is double eternal security. Double eternal security. We are in his hand and in his father's hand. Can we jump out of the father's hand? I mean, numerous reasons why we can't. Okay, John 10, 28 to 29 says the father is greater than all, including the believer. John 10, 28 to 29 promises that believers shall never perish. If you could lose salvation by jumping out or sinning willfully, apparently, according to Daniel, or by any other way, you could perish. And Jesus' promise would be false. Conditionalist Jesus, the, uh, the, the Jesus that Daniel is pushing here tonight, would have us believe that, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither any man Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand unless you pluck yourself out. You don't count as a man and you might be stronger than my hand because apparently if you sin willfully, then you're plucking yourself out of his father's hand. What Daniel's pushing here today is called daisy theology. Daisy theology loves me, loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Oh, you sin willfully, he loves me not. You better hope that you die, apparently, the conditionalist, on the he loves me part. We are saved now. Now are we the sons of God, justified and predestined for glorification. Why can't we lose regeneration? Because God describes salvation in absolutes. We oftentimes see God describing it from his vantage point and our vantage point. And these conditionalists, spiritual abortionists, they think it's all about God's vantage point. No, the Bible says now are we the sons of God. We're predestined for glorification. That's what's future. I debated a guy named Merritt, Crimson Air. He wasted his entire opening statement going over verses Okay, misunderstanding the fact that it is glorification that's future, but it's justification and regeneration that is past, basic. Because God describes salvation in absolutes. We are justified. We are sanctified. Now are we the sons of God. It's done. The ongoing process of sanctification is a different aspect of our salvation. Sanctification is not justification and regeneration. These are different aspects. God describes justification as a legal declaration, an event that happens once and it's done. There's no more revisiting justification. I'm sorry, Daniel. There is no revisiting the new birth. You are born again once in the same way that you're born once, physically speaking, into this world. You can't be unborn. You're born in this world physically once. Once a human, always a human. When you are born again spiritually, you are born again once. Once regenerated, always regenerated. Romans 4, 5 teaches us that the sins we commit after we are saved are not imputed unto us. That goes for willful sin as well. Blessed is the man unto whom God will not, future tense, impute sin. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. We have faith without works, plain and clear. Sin our way to spiritual abortion? Of course not. Sins past, present, and future, including willful sin, has been paid for on the cross. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. And this one verse alone, three verb tenses, never been refuted. I've had many debates on this. They can't refute it. Jesus used all three verb tenses here to underline the eternality of everlasting life. Present tense, the one who believes in Jesus has everlasting life. Future tense, the believer will not come into judgment regarding everlasting life. Past tense, the one who believes in him has passed from death unto life. Done deal. People irreversibly pass from death to life when they believe the gospel. What about the seal? The seal of the Holy Ghost. It's a done deal. Daniel thinks apparently that we can unseal the seal. 
whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. There's no unsealing the seal. Since the title of the debate is, Can a Believer Lose His Salvation? My interlocutor here, Daniel Mira, has the affirmative, and therefore he must demonstrate from Scripture that a born-again believer, somebody who's been truly justified, regenerated, and predestined to glorification, has actually lost their salvation. The scriptures do not teach this, which gives Daniel a very difficult task here tonight. As we've seen in his opening statement, the best verses he could point to were John 15 and Hebrews 10, which I will deal with in great detail in the rebuttal portion. We're not talking here tonight about a loss of physical or earthly salvation. People who believe you can lose your salvation are guilty of the illegitimate totality transfer fallacy. I've seen it over and over again. When they see the word saved and salvation, they wrongfully suppose that these words always refer to deliverance from eternal condemnation. And therefore, they completely miss the point of so many important passages. Many times when we see salvation or to be saved in the Bible, we are looking at earthly salvation or salvation from judgment in this life. I'm going to spend the uh, next few minutes covering a variety of slides demonstrating that work salvation has failed to differentiate between many different aspects of our salvation and our Christian walk. As we pointed out, they're, they're guilty of this fallacy, assuming that when they see a word, it means the same thing in every single context. Uh, burning and fire, that's another word that they assume means the same thing in every single context. It doesn't always refer to hell. Uh, almost all objections raised against the doctrine of eternal security can be traced to a failure uh, to distinguish between relationship truth, truth and fellowship truth. We've seen that in his opening statement with John 15, not understanding the difference between relationship and fellowship. Those that abide are the ones that are fruitful and believers that do not abide in terms of fellowship will be unfruitful. Or between the requirements for salvation, the requirements for discipleship, or between God's eternal judgment and his temporal judgment, or between literal language and figurative language. When we understand these distinctions, the objections melt away. Positional sanctification versus practical sanctification. Uh, that's another important um, distinction that they uh, misunderstand and miss out on. As well as uh, coming to Jesus for service and coming to Jesus to be a disciple. Um, which would have to do with suffering for his sake. There's a difference between that and uh, justification, how to be saved. And brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. It's that simple. But when you see verses that have to do with service, discipleship, what does it say? If any man come to me and hate not his, his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his, his own life also, he cannot be my what? disciple. Does it say he cannot be saved? No, he cannot be my disciple because discipleship has to do with our works and salvation has to do with his work. When you mix One the minute. two, when you mix the two, it results in a works-based salvation, uh, salvation service. I got um, scripture after scripture showing the truth of this. Uh, believers can suffer loss. And what about the believer who then totally wastes his life? Does he prove he was never saved? Does he lose his salvation? You know, those that sin willfully, those that don't abide in terms of fellowship. Well, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Again, the Christian in rebellion can be sure that ever, if all their works are burned up, they will still be saved. Position and experience, there's a difference between our positional sanctification and experiential sanctification, position versus uh, condition. We're going to discuss all of these in the discussion portion. Eternal rewards, right? Eternal life is a free gift given by faith in Jesus apart from works, but eternal rewards are given on the basis of your works. Uh, Daniel here seems to think that salvation itself is a reward. No, it's not a reward. It's based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I got three seconds here, so I will yield and end it there. Thank you so much for listening, guys. God bless.